Okay. So, all right, so I'm going to talk about uh, sound poetry for a little bit here. Um, I'm going to concentrate, uh, well, okay, I'm going to start out just kind of talking a little bit about the idea of sound poetry, which is the, the fact that I think it's kind of strange that um, actual human speech, the, the, the sounds that we're actually allowed to make on a day-to-day -day basis constitute maybe at most 1% of the sounds that the human voice is capable of making, which seems fucking crazy. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think this is something that in itself is kind of interesting, and that's why I want to try to make noises that aren't what we're the, supposed to make. Um, so I think there's this idea that, you know, what makes us, part of what makes us human is the speech and the capacity for speech. And so what I think happens a lot of the time is because of that, when you hear sounds coming out of a person that you're not supposed to use in speech, it can almost be kind of uh, frightening because you start to feel almost as if this person is giving up a part of their humanity. You're acting like an animal now, making making most to make. Um, you know, and so this idea of speech almost becomes this kind of distinction between the human and the animal. Uh, and, and so, you know, you have to, I, I kind of ask how much is being uh, lost by our excluding all of these other sounds uh, from from what we're allowed to actually do, um, you know. And I think another part of what makes non-speech sounds very strange to people um, is is that we want we want people to use speech to express themselves. And when you're making sounds that aren't expressing that aren't, aren't expressing anything in an obvious way, again, it can kind of be pretty disorienting and almost dehumanizing. But within that, I think there's a lot of potential to, to kind of access aspects of human experience or human potential that, that we don't usually think about. Um, and there's a sense, too, where kind of musical tonality and singing kind of serves an analogous function. You, know? you use maybe 2%, maybe, of the sounds that you're able to make when you're singing. So that's a, twice as much as speech. but not nearly as much as what we can actually do. So this is kind of um, a big part of what I think is behind all sound poetry um, and behind what I do. And I've been moving, I started out with sound poetry in the last few years I've been exploring what I'm calling noise poetry um, in, in the sense that if, if, if sound is something that you can still reproduce, you can still kind of notate, you know, like singing, you know, it still kind of retains a certain element of, of familiarity. So I'm really interested lately in exploring noises that that sound particularly unhuman. If I go, okay, it's weird, but I still every part of that sounds like a human being. Talk about that. It doesn't sound so much human. So I'm interested in kind of what you can do with with arranging those kinds of sounds and and. So I'm going to talk uh, first off about the history of, well actually it's going to be one, one very small slice of the history of people exploring those kinds of sounds. And then I'm going to talk uh, most, the majority of the time actually about the technique of how you can kind of conceptualize and how you can actually make, make sounds that, that we're not used to, make noises that we're not used to. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so this is, Again, I'm calling this distinction sound poetry and noise poetry. There's a French tradition which calls noise, what I'm calling noise poetry, cri rhythm, um, like crying rhythm, shrieking rhythm. Um, the, the, the West, I think, is particularly um, restricted in, in the kinds of sounds that we're allowed to make. And so I think there's a sense where sound poetry arises in European culture as a response to the fact that European culture is especially terrified of anything outside of, of what we consider to be speech. Um, so there's a huge, huge amount of, of um, wordless music and wordless chant um, outside of, of the Western orbit, which is a huge influence on what I do, but because I don't want to talk for four hours, I'm going to be really concentrating on a pretty narrow slice of, of, of that tradition. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about those a great deal yet. I do have a, a playlist that I'm going to be playing stuff from that has a lot of non-Western stuff on there as well, which is on YouTube and available, and um, I'll let you know at the end, especially if somebody reminds me how you can find that and look at examples of stuff I'm not talking about here too. 
Um, uh, so there, but I think within Western culture, there's a sense where sound poetry kind of functions almost as a return of the repressed. It's everything the West has tried to repress in itself. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to be concentrating here on specifically, first off, specifically the, the, the avant-garde tradition of sound poetry, and not not talking here so much about other um, other traditions that, that that feed into that. I'm going to actually be even more specifically focusing on noise poetry, because sound poetry even, um, there's a huge amount of territory to cover that, again, I don't really have time for. So I'm going to be looking at some sound poetry, mostly at people who have really tried to explore the, specifically the sounds that you're not supposed to make, and not just patterns you're not supposed to make with vocal sounds, like phonetics. So it's sounds that are not phonetic, I guess would be a way to look at it. Um, so, uh, from my own research, the, the earliest kind of, right, that's where I'm going to start, is going to be 19th century uh, Romanticism, um, where people start thinking about sound more than meaning, or, or thinking about sound as, as inflecting meaning in a particularly strong way. Um, a lot of this comes from theories uh, arising around the beginning of the 19th century, which may or may not be accurate, but it, it got people thinking ideas that language derived originally from music. And so this, uh, the idea was that people uh, started out singing, and that singing devolved into speech. Um, whether or not that's true, it's an interesting thought that got people thinking about language um, in a different way. And it, it, among other things, it got people really thinking about onomatopoeia, words that are the sounds that they make. Boom, bang, bark you know, things like that. Um, one of the first people to really systematically look at this was a, a Frenchman named Charles Nodier, um, who wrote a dictionary of onomatopoeia um, in the 1820s somewhere, um, who was a huge influence in the French Romanticist movement, and was the first person I found uh, in the avant-garde to write sound poetry. Um, the, so the, the earliest sound poem that I found was written in 1830, um, and I'm going to read that to you now. It's fairly short. Um, and it appears in a, an experimental novel that he wrote called The, uh, the King of the Seven Castles of the King of Bohemia. Um, so this poem is called Invention, and it goes something like person answers, how can you not know? Is it not the consecrated language, the imitated and descriptive poetry of, de of decennial prizes, the patented loquacity of imperial muses? Uh, is this not the perfected interpretation of human thought for which the Iroquois journal... Blah, 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 blah. He says, you're not noticing, by the way, that this page, unique in all the monuments ever written to language, conceals beneath the semblance of a simple silly joke the most powerful effort of a creative imagination. The secret of the novum organum, of the characteristic, the universal intelligibility of the Kabbalists, the eclectics, and the doctrinaires, so enamored of clarity, still seeking to palpitate. Um, and he goes on to give us an interpretation. From the first line, which is, we hear the impatient steeds stamping, 
and subsequently take heed. They whinny, they quiver, they whinny incessantly. A whoons, a whoons, a whoons, a hurrah, 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 right? Uh, uh, the coachman, the coachman is off. He keeps them covered with his eyes. He enjoins them with the voice, uh, which is uh, clack, clack, lee, la, flick, la, fa, 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 you know, all of this. They whinny, they trot. So this whole thing, basically, is supposed to tell the story of a, a, a male coach ride. Um, so this is the idea. Um, so you start to have this, uh, this, this kind of concept introduced into poetry. Um, a couple years later, in 1833, um, one of his uh, acolytes, somebody who he basically initiated into the avant-garde, Théophile Gautier, specifically quotes this in his own sound poem, which is worked into a short story about romanticist subculture, um, kind of describing a romanticist uh, um, meal, which is actually not unlike like a 60s happening or something, their costume and role-playing and all this crazy shit. Um, and he actually writes a simultaneous poem, so his, he has one person saying, Pan Pan, Bling Bling, Brrr, Humph, Fi, Yu, Hu, Bwa. And the other person simultaneously is saying, Fru, Fru, Clack, Ahi, Ahi, Ah, O, Paf, Oof. That's the poem. But you'll notice he's actually specifically quoting Gautier's poem there. So we're starting to see a, a, a sound poetry tradition developing already in 1830, though it's, it's just here and there, little bits and pieces. Um, these same people were also thinking about the, the parts of language that, don't, that aren't meaning in other ways, too. So um, a lot of the poetry at this time, they start using non-phonetic poetries a lot, like O's, and then da-da-da-da, eh, e. Ah, these, they just put these sounds into their poems for you know, this kind of expressive, you know, kind of like, just like you would when you're in real life. You see it and you go, whoa! But they start putting that into poetry. You're not supposed to put whoa into poetry in 1830. Um, they pick out specific letters and syllables which are romanticist letters. So if you use K, like K, W, Y, and H, these were considered to be especially avant-garde, romanticist letters because they weren't used in French very much. <laughs> um, diphthongs were considered to be romanticist sounds, and so you would work these into your poems whenever you can. Um, and there are these kind of signifiers that don't actually mean anything, but they tell you that this person's a romanticist. Um, and then you, if you, you always, if possible, you add us to the end of your name. Um, so if your name is Albert, you call yourself Albertus. If your name is Peter, you call yourself Patris. And this is how people know you're a romantic. Um, um, they also start doing weird things with punctuation. You'll have poems where you have a word and then it goes uh, dot, 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 comma, dash, dot, dot, dot. And so they're, they're, they're actually articulating silence um, as if it's a syllable in a weird way. And so you start seeing these, they're, they're small steps, but they're small steps away from just thinking of words as a way to communicate um, in a straightforward kind of way. They were also starting to use noise in music, and I think this is important too. Uh, this community, and these were the first, the first people who called themselves the avant-garde. Um, um, and they, they were an avant-garde dance called the Infernal Gallop. Now what this is, is everybody runs around in a circle as fast as you can, and if somebody trips, you just run over them. It's the exact same thing as the punk circle pit, with one important exception. The time is kept by shooting pistols into the air. Um, this dance was developed by a guy named Napoleon Moussard, who was also um, uh, working non-musical sounds into his music, so his music would have uh, you know, cannons shooting off. They would have people, you, uh, uh, there was a, he wrote a, a piece called The Broken Chair Gallop, in which everybody smashing chairs on the ground at time with the music. Um, and so he became known for working this kind of stuff. And he's almost, he's like a 19th century Spike Jones in a kind of way, not the director, the musician. Um, and so you have this, the, the main romanticist avant-garde group uh, was called uh, uh, the Jeune France, the, the Young French, but they deliberately misspelled it, adding an S where they shouldn't. And they later changed the name to the Bouzon Joe, which they also deliberately misspelled in their words to piss off the bourgeoisie. 
Well, they would hold noise concerts in their uh, backyard. Uh, they would go out to thrift shops or the, you know, the, the 19th century version of thrift shops, junk shops, buy a bunch of cheap, broken musical instruments, bring them back. They would invite all of their friends and they would hold a concert. And the only rule was that if you started to learn how to play your instrument at all, you had to switch. Um, and so this is the, the earliest noise concerts or free improv concerts that I've managed to find. Um, and so this, this is a community, you know, right from the very beginning, the avant-garde was starting to think about noise, you know, and, and how does it, how can you incorporate this into other things. Um, in the next generation, you have what's called the Parnassian movement. They're not as raucous and crazy, but they do, uh, they are very concerned with, with basically vowel music. And I, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit when I get into the technique section about how vowels work, but uh, each vowel um, has a distinct um, um, uh, kind of tonality from, a, from the other vowels. That tonality will be different from person to person. One person's E isn't the same as this next person's E, but your E, if you don't move your Adam's apple, will always be different than your A. E, A, E, A, E, A, O, E, A, O, E, A, O, E, A, O. I'm not moving my Adam's apple there. This is inherent in the vowels. So when people are writing poetry, although the poetry still had meaning, um, it, they were composing the poetry by vowels and then finding a meaning to fit into the vowel music. Um, and so, you know, again, you're, you're, you have this kind of movement toward what's going to become uh, uh, sound poetry. Um, and the following generation, the symbolists, um, I'm kind of moving pretty quick here, but uh, the symbolists were working with uh, considered words and sounds and rhythms uh, to be basically kind of mediators between the, the physical nervous system and the psychology and our emotional apparatus. And so the idea was that certain rhythms, certain sounds, certain tonalities, even certain vowels have certain resonances that create emotional responses in the, in the reader, or in the, not really in the reader, in the, in the reader aloud or in the listener. Um, and so again, kind of moving on from the Parnassians, they're, they're really writing poems very much with an eye toward what is the physiological effect of the poem, not just what is the meaning of the poem, but what is its effect on the body. Um, um, it's around this time you get uh, a guy named Henri Barzun, who has a concept he calls simultaneism, and he starts writing poems for multiple voices at once. Um, I have not been able to get a hand on any of his work. It's not been scanned online or anything. It's extremely rare. But it was apparently very big influence on the Dada movement. Um, and so now at this point you have multiple voices going on at once and you, you're creating a cacophony of, 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 of sorts. Because this isn't like written music where it's, it's all, you know you're going to be on beat with everybody else, right? Um, there's going to be a, a, a movement, an ebb and flow in how these voices relate, and you're creating noise in between these voices, and so you're moving closer and closer to noise. This brings us to what people, more people know of as the avant-garde, because the, the, I, a lot of what I've been telling you is kind of based on my own uh, research, asking questions that people haven't been asking. Uh, with futurism, you get to where people are more familiar with the avant-garde uh, existing. And the futurists really come up, the Italian futurists, with phonetic poetry straight up. They're the first people who say, let's just get rid of words and just write with sounds. Um, and so they're writing what's called phonetic poetry. It's take strip language down to the phonemes, the units of language. They're still units of language. It's not quite noise necessarily, but you're getting to pure sound poetry. A lot of it's still based on onomatopoeia. These people were reading Modier the first guy that I read the piece of. Um, so they're very interested in this, and they're very interested in spontaneity. And this is different from the earlier people. They are interested in, in what, what noise comes out when you're not thinking ahead of what noise you want to make. Um, um, so I'm going to play a little bit. I'm probably not going to play a whole lot of entire poems just for, the re for time, but I want to give you some examples of what a lot of this stuff sounded like now that we're into the realm of recording music. Um, okay, so hopefully this is going to work. Well, okay, if my, if my thing starts, okay. So, let's see here. 
this is a, a futurist poem called Zane Tong Tun, part of one, by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. Before you start thinking these people were really cool, they were all uh, fucking fascists. But uh, as we'll see, the Dada movement takes a lot of what they're doing and they turns that for non-evil purposes. Uh, except that my connection just went out for some reason. Just a second here. Oh, let it go. Cherry Street, right? Uh, yeah. Let's get my computer. My computer went to sleep. Okay, let's see. It's totally going to be worth the wait. Okay, here we go. Ogni cinque secondi, cannoni d'assedio, and arrestation. This is a. Uh, this is this poem from 1912. I'm still using a lot of Italian, but we're going to hear some violence. Here's a Fortuna, uh, Fortuna de Pera, this is another futurist piece, shortly before World War One. phonemes that are almost noise, like a rolled R. Yeah, you know, if I say, you know, I went there, you know, okay, you can, it's a phonetic piece, but when you draw it out, it stops sounding like speech. And so they're like, they like all these fricatives that when you draw out become noise. Um, and so uh, you have this, uh, this futurism very quickly spread to most of Europe, especially Russia, the Russian futurists were not fascists, so that's good. Um, and they uh, did a lot of the same stuff, but also added this interest in transrational language, this idea that language was capable of communicating on a level that is not that of rational meaning, but that you can kind of uh, directly communicate emotion through sound. Um, and so this, this is a big thing with futurism. Now, the Dada movement, futurism begins in 1909. It uh, runs basically through World War II. It kind of keeps going after World War II, but with the fall of fascism, it, it, it mostly peters out as well, the temporary fall of fascism. Um, with Dada, uh, then, Dada comes along in 1916, and they are really trying to kind of take a lot of what the futurists are doing, push it farther aesthetically, but also draw it back into really more of an anarchist um, kind of, uh, of, of uh, praxis. Um, and so the Dada, and, and the Dadas take this idea and they, they start really exploring different directions that sound poetry can go. And, and, and it, it, the, the range of options within this practice expands hugely with Dada. So a lot of it is still phonetic, and, and, and um, you have a few different ways that various Dada's uh, approach this. Um, so there, a lot of it was very kind of, it's a, a lot of it was very much about affect. You wanted to really get people excited. Um, what's, you know, what's the immediate effect when you do it? 
Um, it's very spontaneous, it's very emotive, it's very absurd. Um, you know, Rick, uh, Richard Kustenbeck and, and Tristan Zara are kind of the, the big people to kind of push this. Um, uh, so they, they, they have what's called Bruitist poetry, which technically is noise poetry, um, especially Hilsenbeck. There are no uh, recordings of Hilsenbeck um, performing this stuff, um, but his work uh, combined, um, combined words with, you know, very directly, like you'd have a few words and then a noise and a noise and a few more words and a noise. Very, very aggressive. He had a huge cane that he would smash on the stage and threaten the audience with as he was doing it. And typically, people were trying to attack him as he was performing, throwing uh, ve vegetable vendors would set up outside the cabaret Voltaire and sell rotten vegetables to people going into the cabaret to s throw the dots for making this. And so, the, the way that this noise functioned was to really foment this chaotic atmosphere. Um, so this was kind of one way uh, that things went. Uh, let me see. So here's a, here's a. This is not the original recording of, of a Dada simultaneous poem. There aren't any original recordings. But here's a reproduction of a simultaneous poem in this way, written by Zara Gunsenbeck and Marcel Yanko. In three different languages. <laughs> Even those instruments are scored. This is all scored out, three lines written above each other. So you're, you're, as you're reading these performances, you're half reading the lines above and below and trying to keep up. But there's always a, speaking from experience, always a shift. People are moving a little far ahead and moving behind while the other person moves ahead. And so there's always, again, this kind of noisy disjunction um, happening with, with, how this, with how this works. So this is kind of one way that, that, that Dada sound poetry goes. Um, and a lot of the focus of this is in how crazy it is. Like, this is nuts! You never believe what we're doing! Um, there's also another sense, which is a very kind of shamanic and mystical sense of, of sound. This idea, and, and this really goes back to, you know, uh, uh, chant, um, you know, both, you know, within like liturgical chant and Western culture and chant in all kinds of societies all over the world, um, which are ahead of us in this regard, really. Hugo Ball and Kurt Schwitters, and also in a weird way, Antona Artaud, are, are all kind of representatives of this. Um, this is a poem, again, we don't have the original performance of uh, recording of Hugo Ball doing this poem, but here's a, a poem called uh, Caravane by Hugo Ball, performed by somebody else. When, when he performed this poem, he had, um, and he, in the same kind of situation, he was, he was actually in a, a cardboard tube, this absurdist costume, on the stage, and people were trying to attack him, and the other Dadas were fighting them off as he does this performance poem. And he writes about being completely kind of terrified in the situation, because he's in this current where he can't move. Like, they could just knock him over like a bowling pin and beat the shit out of him if they wanted to. So, and he talks about being stuck here and not knowing how to perform it, and then he just slips into uh, the, the kind of liturgical rhythms from when he was a child in church. And he had a mystical, like a religious experience as he was performing this poem. Came out of it a changed person. He dropped out of the Dada movement a few uh, weeks later and became a hermit on a mountaintop in Italy and was revered as a saint by the peasants in the neighborhood when he died. And so this is, you know, a very different sense of what sound poetry can do than what his friends were doing, being like, I'm gonna fuck you up, you know. Um, so. So here's you better, something. You better look out. Right. Yeah. So here's a uh, here's a bit of, of uh, somebody else performing that that poem that he was doing when that happened. Called the Kung Fu. That's the guy talking about it. Just a second. Ui fan do am lao fall am la grossen fablauren an. Oh, 
Bung, Bung Bosok Sadaka. So here the focus really is on the inner experience of the performer and, and ex uh, communicating that experience, whether directly or indirectly, to the listeners, um, a kind of uh, very different kind of attitude. Um, another way that, that the Dada's kind of develop things is more of a kind of a structural, kind of musical sense of, of really trying to build patterns in a more, more kind of complicated way. So the most famous version of this is Kurt Schwitter's uh, Ursonata which is an hour-long sound poem, which is, is kind of still probably one of the great masterpieces of sound poetry. Um, here's a little bit of, of Schwitter's. Actually, we thought for a, almost a century that this was Schwitter's performing it. It was recently discovered it's actually his son performing it based on his memory of his father's version. Um, but I'll do just a little bit of this very long poem here. It's an example. I'm going to skip to the middle a bit here. No, that was a mistake. Nah, no. No. Bones Bobotas, pushes toward, was the first person to really push strongly toward noise. And the way he did this was by using very short um, collections of letters um, uh, and, and drawing as much noise out of those short collections of letters um, as he was able to do. And a lot of them were just literally, he would tear up a newspaper and take a little section out of it and be like, this is my poem, and perform it. So here's a little bit of a, a, a Ralph Hausman, uh, some Ralph Hausman performance here. Briggs war je antor Kaskade der Raoul Hausmann. Enregistré le 25 et 26 mai 1966. Much more about breath, you know, breath. This is, I think, 1922, something like that. strongly toward, toward noise here. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is really kind of pushing the emphasis in sound poetry increasingly toward the voice and the body. Again, like breath becomes a, a, a unit of composition or, or a unit of improvisation. Um, 
So Dada, you have this explosion of, of sound poetry and of ways of approaching it and of thinking about it and what sound can do. The Surrealists really cut this off. Da, you know, the, the, the Surrealist movement is a splinter of the Dada movement. And in certain ways, this is a gross reduction, but there is a certain way in which the Surrealists were really a drawing back from Dada, saying this is a little bit too crazy. Um, and so they really reject sound poetry um, as, as a part of that Dada um, nonsense that, that, that they weren't comfortable with, which I think is closely related to noise. Noise is that which cannot be assimilated, and it made the Surrealists very nervous. Um, he, you don't really see it then for a few decades. It comes back with the Lettrist movement in the 1950, late 1940s and kind of reaches maturity in the 50s. The Lettrists are saying, okay, what if we take, we've dealt with phonetics, you know, the phoneme, the, the, the unit of speech, the, the syllable, basically. Phonetics, the phonetic poetry is using syllables. The Lettrists say, what if we break it down to just a letter? Right? Um, and so they, with the Lettrists, you really move into the realm of noise entirely, and, and they do that in various ways. So, um, uh, and they are derived from Hausmann to the point where they had a lot of arguments with Hausmann, who was older by this point, over who invented Lettrism, which is kind of one of those stupid arguments people have, but it really just atomizes uh, uh, language. So here's, um, let's see. here's a Lettrist chant, some Lettrist sound poetry. Just a little bit of it here, give you a sample. Theory. Come on, come on, come on. So I say. Um, while it's loading. Uh, so this is um, the, the main kind of formulators of Lettrism are Maurice Lemaitre and, um, okay, it doesn't have a lot of delay right now. Okay. Here, let's put here's some lemonade. It'll play. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Come on. How long do I get it? Hmm, all right, let's try this one. All right, you may have to look uh, at Tristan up on your own. The Lemaitre and uh, Isidore Isu are the kind of main people there. All right, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> and hope the ultra Lettris will play. Has the internet stopped? I don't know. Uh, it, I still have a signal, but it's not, uh, not doing much. Can I uh, okay. inter interrupt for a minute? Sure. Okay. Uh, I was really interested in uh, hearing that uh, first we heard an Italian uh, mm -hmm. speaking this minute, and then some Germans. And so, uh, because these uh, sounds are uh, uh, written written text. Each person is using the sounds from their own language. language so that you can right. tell from the Italians that this is an Italian speaking and from the Germans that this is the German right. speaking. So that uh, for like for Americans, we don't have any, uh, uh, the, the Yiddish or Arabic right, right. sound. So this is a sound that you would, you would, if you saw it written CH or something, you would write right. ch ch ch. You would, yeah, you would speak it differently than if you learn the sound from a foreign language. Right, right. So so sound poetry seems so close to uh, improvisation for this reason that if you have a text and you know how to pronounce all the words, you are not improvising, you are getting that meaning across. But if you don't know if there's a variation in how you can pronounce that, right. you're yeah. really much freer in terms of the way it's going to sound. Right. Different people. Yeah. It, which is kind of a, a, one of the interesting things about the way that sound poetry is scored, I think, as opposed to musical scores, is that it's, it's, it, there's always a, a gap um, between the score and the interpretation. Um, right, I, I may finish the historical part without demonstrations here, so let us look on that. But, 
I'll, I'll describe it, I'll get onto the technical, the technical how-to bit anyway, uh, which I don't need this for. So, um, yeah, but if it, or uh, cross swat to frame, we'll start belting out stuff at us while I'm in the middle of talking if we're lucky. Um, so after the, so you have the letterists kind of dealing with letters, and then you have a splinter group from them, because the avant-garde loves splinter groups at this point, called the ultra letterists. Um, uh, this is largely uh, Francois Dufresne, which is definitely one of my big guys, uh, Jules Volman, and Jean-Louis Bro, uh, and they they break it down beyond the letter. And this is the point where they're really playing with just pure noise. This is the uh, um, uh, Dufresne is the one who coins this term cri rhythm, you know, shrieking rhythm would be how I would prefer to pro to, to translate it, and he is literally just. Screaming and shrieking and making noises that there are no letters for, uh, which we're not hearing right now. But uh, um, but this is the point where really people are just dealing with noise. It's not even connected with the score anymore at this point. A lot of them are working without a score, um, so you don't even have that at this point. You still also you know you, but definitely still the you know national language is always kind of in there in terms of what sounds people are using and whether a sound is noise or not, because by the same token, a, a uh, you know, is a noise for us, but it's not for the French, it's a sound. Um, and so you have these, these kind of weird things until you draw it out. Um, so all, the ultra electrists are working in the 1950s and 60s, and as you move into the 60s, they start working with electronics as well. And so it's, it's with these guys, especially Bro, that you end up um, really having manipulated voice, where they're recording the voice, they're looping it, they're putting distortion on it, and, and it's it's actually uncanny if I could play it, that you, the, the extent to which some of the stuff in the 50s and 60s sounds almost like noise music that's being produced today. Um, uh, and so you, you, at this point, you're not even dealing with that kind of supposed purity of the human voice anymore. You're just dealing with, uh, you know, really, what can you get out of the voice? Where can you take it once you start piling on other effects and things? Um, and so with this, in the 50s and 60s, you really get this kind of return of sound poetry, first in Europe and then in the United States, um, and of, of noise poetry. There's a, a excellent um, uh, sound poet around this time named Ilse Garnier, a, a female uh, sound poet who had an idea called spatialism and was doing you know, some of the earliest manipulated uh, sound poetry. You have a guy named Henri Chopin who started putting contact mics inside of his mouth and, and doing sound poetry from within the mouth and then running that through effects and things like that. He ran a sound poetry journal called U, O-U, for many years, which was kind of the, 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 the poetic center of, of sound poetry for a very long time. Um, this is like a, a, a disc, an audio magazine on, uh, on disc. Uh, a guy named Paul DeVries, who's really playing with looping and layering of the voice, not necessarily a whole lot of distortion, except putting very heavy uh, reverb and stuff like that on there. Um, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm kind of skipping forward to the present now, because at the point you get that kind of explosion. Uh, you, you get so many approaches to sound poetry that, you know, for purposes of time, I'm going to say, then lots of shit happens. Um, uh, th uh, one interesting woman working today in sound poetry is named Anat Peek, who has what idea she calls creaturely poetics, and this is the idea of writing poetry for animals. And so her, she's doing sound poetry, she also performs Marinetti and stuff like that, but she's really looking, really exploring that idea of, of you know, what is language as a, if it functions as a, a bodily function and not necessarily as a means of a semantic communication. Um, so looking at, the, you know, what's the relationship between human speech and bird call and, and other, other um, uh, animal noises, animal forms of communication. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to go. I'm going to talk about some technique stuff now. Um, I'm going to close this so that Dufresne doesn't uh, burst in upon me. I will. Uh, so, if you're interested and happen to have a pencil, um, the 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 uh, where I'm so trying to draw these from, and you can ask me afterward. I have a, a YouTube uh, playlist called Sound Poetry Chant and Vocal Play. 
which is where all of this stuff is drawn from. And I actually have about, about 100 videos on there that trace uh, both the history of sound poetry uh, up to the present and also a lot of other um, non-Western and, and vernacular traditions like efing and, and beatbox and things like that that are essentially exploring the same territory um, in a different framework. This is on YouTube, on YouTube. But I mean, you have a list on your uh, website? Mm, no, no, it's just on YouTube. Sorry. But <laughs> I do have some websites, but... Um, yeah, so, I'm going to close that. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about technique. Um, I'm going to take some water first. Okay. So, um, I'm going to... Uh, I, I, I'm not going to do a full kind of workshop here because it's not really kind of going to work, but I might ask you to do some things to see what I'm talking about. Um, so, if you're looking at that, you know, kind of composing with sound uh, on this level, with noise, I guess, you can start off with, with, uh, with phonetics and we kind of work off from phonetics. I'm going to look at it that way. The first kind of distinction you run into, of course, when you're looking at, at this kind of thing, is going to be vowels and consonants and how those work. Um, you can kind of look at this almost as voice versus percussion. Uh, vowels are voiced, uh, consonants on their own become percussive. It's the basis of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, beatbox. So you have, uh, within the consonants, you have stops, full stops, and those are your straight up percussion. Um, you have the fricatives, which you can draw out, and, and as you draw them out, they become textures. All of those can actually be manipulated by moving your lips slightly, you know. Um, things like that. You have the nasals, which are partly voiced. It's kind of a, a hybrid. Mm, mm, but they can also be messed with in other ways. They'll talk about like that. Um, you have glottal consonants, uh, which don't really, in terms of, of noise poetry or sound poetry, function as consonants so much as they function as interruptions in a stream of sound. It's basically it's a bit, you know. You know, the, the people talk about like Cockney, you know, hey, what's up, uh, huh? you know, okay, that's a kind of a consonant, not really in this context. Um, within those consonants, you have other things. How much is a consonant backed up by the voice? The difference between a or a right? And so you can start, even as you're using consonants, those consonants start to become modified depending on how much you're actually coordinating it with, with your throat. Um, is it a stream? Is it an attack? <laughs> Starts to function almost like a texture. Um, sometimes you can even draw those out. Uh, you've got a... But uh, if you sustain that, it becomes a... Right? Um, and so you start to... And it becomes a, a, pretty, a, a pretty harsh kind of texture. Um, so this is kind of one, one thing that you play with you want to start really thinking about how do you compose with, uh, I'm using the word compose loosely here, um, uh, with, with, well, with consonants. Um, beatbox is, is actually, when it is notated, it's still notated according to letters. It, it is visually distinguishable from letristic poetry, um, although it's typically much better than letristic poetry in terms of technique. Um, so you've got that, you've got the kind of drawing out, you've got rolling, you can roll certain consonants. I have a hypothesis, it's technically possible to roll any consonant, but I can't prove it yet. I'm still, I'm still held up on the S. Can't quite do it. But you can roll your R's, obviously, and you can voice that or unvoice it. Or... And that can also be combined with... Forcing air out from my mouth uh, directly through my lips as I'm rolling the R there, or through the back of the throat, 
that's right, right here, I'm constricting my throat, and then through the front of my mouth, rolling it. So a lot of uh, those really stranger sounds come, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but they come from uh, compartmentalizing the different parts of your vocal apparatus and uh, teaching yourself how to control them separately when we've been untrained from that in order to make sure that we only produce linguistic sounds or, or, or you know, the, yeah, linguistic sounds. You've been trained to connect certain functions with other functions to make sure you don't produce the kinds of noises that I am trying to produce. Um, you can also roll a T, it's harder. It's just a matter of about the front third of your tongue, the back third of your tongue you hold uh, still, the front part of your tongue you allow to vibrate, and that's the basis of any kind of rolling. I can almost do this. Uh, a P, a rolled P is. Most of us can do that. Um, so there are some consonants. Um, you know, vowels again are basically the tone of your voice, um, and this is where you can get in again. You can find the natural tone of each vowel. So, and you can do this right now if you want to, and don't feel dumb, which you shouldn't. But you know, hold on to your Adam's apple. Go ah. Uh, just don't move your voice up or down, but just go through the vowels. A e o e o e a o a e o e a o e o e o a. And so you'll see each vowel has its own kind of natural tonality in relation to the other vowels in your throat. But that relationship is going to be different for each person. And so this is where, you know, in noise poetry, really, you are learning the, the peculiarities of your own body and how to do that. Of course, you can also, of course, inflect your voice up and down as you do that and go, ooh! But you actually have, it's, it's, it's almost as if uh, this was noise, you see you have two dials that you can, you can move independently to play with the, with the, the tonality of your vowel. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so you kind of got that going on. Um, you've got long vowels versus short vowels, oh, ah, oh, ah. Really, in, in terms of noise poetry, I'm not sure it's important that both of those come from O. Um, if you're doing sound poetry from a score, then that's, that's another uh, variation you can work into how you interpret a score. Um, so then there's this idea, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, I, I kind of get the, the terminology from Roland Barthes called the grain of the voice. And so, you know, your throat, probably my throat more than most people's, but everybody's throat has is kind of scarred up um, on the inside. You have little, you know, dimples and, and, and divots in your throat. And, you know, typically we're forcing air through our throat at such a speed that it's flat, is past those things and doesn't affect our voice in an obvious way unless we have a very dry throat or something like that, right? But if you, if you reduce the amount of air going through and constrict your throat so that it, it is, it, the air catches in those little divots, you end up with these textures and actually rhythms that are specific to the quote-unquote imperfections of your throat. And when we talk about an imperfection being an opportunity for something interesting, we're back in the realm of noise here. Uh, you can hear this little grain in there, you know? And it's almost a rhythm. It's almost, it's, it's, it's like it's just kind of catching. <laughs> um, so this is something you can kind of play with, and it can be, you know, merged, even merged with a consonant texture. It's, it's, it's you know, um, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, yes, and so a lot of kind of, I think, getting interesting noises is kind of finding spaces in between phonetic sounds, places that are kind of caught in between two sounds that you're supposed to make, or that you're, you're forcing air through in a way that you're not to, and it touches different parts of your body that you're not really supposed to. Um, you kind of, you know, and, and then when you get into the rolled R's and things like that, you start to move into a realm where it's, it's almost a combination of a consonant and a vowel. You know, there is, there's a sense where has 
that has qualities of a vowel because it's this kind of constant voice, but with those that those but it, uh, it's also it's like a, a constant voice with a blast beat behind it or something. Um, is a vowel. Is I'm sorry. Is a consonant. Uh, is a vowel, but is somewhere kind of weirdly in between. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Um, you think about in terms of kind of the contour of a sound. You have kind of tensions um, that, that you can kind of play within, like the tension between speech and noise. And singing is kind of somewhere in between there, you know. And so this is a, I'm thinking here of ways of conceptualizing the noises that you're making, or how you can compose those noises and how you can combine them and move from one to the other in interesting ways. Um, obviously, pitch is an obvious one. Is an obvious one. Um, you know, another way to look at it, you've got syllables, syllabics on one hand, pick-a-booka, 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 and then on the other hand, it's just textures and things. Um, you've got, you can play with tensions between specific patterns, again, pick-a-booka, 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 and kind of these ludic, playful responses where you don't know why you're making this noise, you know, um, surprising yourself. Um, uh, when you're playing with pitch, um, you can kind of, one thing that you can do is assign certain pitches to certain syllables, especially if you're working with a score, if you're doing something like the Ursonaut. Every time you hit a certain syllable, it's a certain, you know, bo, bo, ka, bo, ka, bo, ka, bo, ka, bo, ka, bo, bo, ka, 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 assigning a certain tone to each syllable, you end up with a musical kind of uh, effect. Um, so that's the thing you can kind of, kind of play with. Um, okay, in terms of coming up with weird sounds, this is, I'm gonna go over kind of the way that I have come to conceptualize it and how to come to kind of think about my own um, technique. The first part is to really figure out you know, what are the different parts of the of your vocal apparatus and learning how to isolate your control of each of those. So you've got it's got the diaphragm and the lungs, and you know, like a is mainly a diaphragm sound. You know, that's basically it's a uh, a guttural if you're you know, looking at death metal. Um, you've got the throat. I mean, almost everything goes through the throat. The thing is, you know, where is the, um, where is the, 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 the origin of the sound, in a sense? Is the, is the throat acting as the source of the sound, or just a conduit of the sound? Um, you've got sounds that are made in the mouth, you've got your lips, so like, you know, you can you know, ooh, is mostly in my mouth. It's the mouth that's actually creating the change there, right? The lips, especially when, for instance, that's my lips. It's the, the lips holding very firm. It's the same because some of how a kazoo would work, you know, and forcing the air through there. Um, uh, and then saliva, which is a very big part of my own practice. Um, and saliva can function, first off it functions as a lubricant, which you sometimes need, especially when you're doing throat uh, stuff. Um, another kind of thing, like, build up your throat if you're going to do this, because if you just kind of go right at it, you're going to fuck your throat up. Um, so it's a matter of kind of figuring out how much you can take and stopping and then building it up over, you know, over time. Um, but there's that, but also saliva, actually, as it, as it starts to build up, you can actually just play with it, and it produces kinds of textures and sounds that you really can't get any other way. Um, uh, the kind of sound a little bit similar to, to the grain of the throat, in a way. Um, and the, I'll be doing plenty of that later, so... Um, yeah, um, when you've got a vowel, you can kind of alter the vowel through any of those. You know, through the chest, through constricting your throat, through the mouth. So if I got to go with E, E, I can, if I want to alter that in my chest, E, those are all in the chest. Throat constriction, E, 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 E,
um, through the mouth. You can do that. The shape of the lips, if I do E with everything but that. That's an E with a constricted lips. Um, you know, things like that. Um, and so, the way that I work it is, is I, I kind of, my own kind of mental process with these for my, works for me, is kind of thinking of it basically based on how like a noise set would work. You have a source sound, you put that sound through effects. And so I, I tend to think of a source and then an effect. Um, and so each of your vocal apparatus is a different effect that you can put on that sound, you know. You have a limited number of source sounds, but an almost unlimited number of effects that you can put on it and combine and loop to create an almost endless number of other, of other sounds. Um, and then like, that kind of looping is another thing, especially when you're thinking about pattern. But you can also, you know, you can pattern, you know, peek a 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 peek But you can also pattern those sounds. You know. Um, so that's something you can do. And then simultaneous sounds, which you can sometimes do. You can get multiple sounds out of your uh, body at the same time. It is a matter of figuring out a sound that doesn't need all of, your, all of these parts of the body, and other sound that doesn't need the ones you're already using. Um, you know, so, uh, I don't know. <laughs> You can also interject a sound into a stream of sound, and it will uh, it'll kind of sound as if you're, you're, you're what we will hear the, the, the constant sound behind the interjection, um, kind of naturally, we'll tend to fill that in. It's not technically two sounds at once, but you can almost make it function as if it were. Um, yeah, let me see here. And I am guessing, first off, that I'm nearing the end of my time, and I'm mainly moving on to just general improvisation kind of uh, advice here, so that might be an okay place to, to close it off, I think, maybe, unless there are questions or anything like that. There's my anti-climax of an ending to a lecture. <laughs> and then I was done. <laughs> So yeah, I can do that real quick. So I, I, I can tell you what my kind of warm-up um, regimen is, which is uh, fairly simple. Um, so I'll first kind of start out in the middle on moves up, up just to the point where it's comfortable, down to the point where it's comfortable, up just beyond comfortable, down just so I'll kind of you walk, and I'll kind of I'll, I'll go through the vowels. You walk, you walk, you walk, you walk, you walk. Also, that growl is just an extremely low voice. It's when you push your voice lower than it can go, and you go lower anyway. That's what you get. So I kind of do that, you know. So you can find then there's a certain. Uh, a certain tonality that's particularly, you know, painful to hear in a way. And so you can kind of do that as, I don't know how to, if I was trained as a singer, I could probably describe this better. Um, but the, with, with the up and down, you're kind of moving that, and then you can kind of move into like a, a normal voice and move into this kind of nasally, kind of, and I, what it feels like is that my throat's opening up. Um, 
And, uh, and then after that, I think you, you kind of wait on, you wait on doing the really heavy that stuff until you built a bit of phlegm up into, in your throat, so, which will kind of naturally happen. Just don't swallow quite as often. Um, and when it starts to build up in there a little bit, you can start to give yourself a little bit of But you kind of want to keep your, keep your saliva in the part of your throat where you can feel a noise being made um, as, as that kind of lubricant. And as you do that more, it'll, if you start building it up more, you'll find that the range you can play with within that starts growing and growing and growing. Um, and then if you're like me, eventually it starts coming out of your mouth and people are like, ew, gross, and then they leave the venue. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it's kind of that, that that's the mainly, as far as like that kind of safety kind of issue, that's kind of what I do. And it is something, I mean, I do this, I kind of, I tend to rehearse a few times a week, and so it, I, I produce more phlegm when I've been rehearsing regularly, so you kind of train your body to be ready for it in a way. Um, I'll also do things like, you know, kind of, you know, find vowels that are far apart and kind of do patterns like that to get your mouth, that's kind of my mouth exercise, um, you know, and then like, you know, just rolling stuff for a long time, and then, you know, I'll, I'll pick, you know, I'll do like, with clicking, I'll do like, my, my favorite is I'll do like the beginning of Master of Puppets. So you can kind of choose something difficult. <laughs> you kind of choose something difficult to do, and you kind of train yourself up to it just for, you know, uh, that. But yeah, so that's that's kind of that's kind of my warm up regimen. It's kind of those three things typically. Yeah, and then as far as making sounds, honestly, most of my real rehearsal comes in like in the shower or while I'm cooking. That's one thing that's nice about this practice. It's easy to kind of combined with, with mindless activities, you, you know, as opposed to a lot of other stuff you need to rehearse, so, yeah. Um, any other questions, or, yeah. Is there any precedent history of jaw snapping, like, like, jaw snapping, like, closing your mouth really quickly, like, using the teeth, opening the teeth, and stuff like that? Not that, that's a good question. Not that I know of, actually. That's a good idea, though. I say that, unless it, it, it could hurt a lot. But, uh, but you could say that for a lot of things that I do, so there may be a way not to. It would probably work especially well, I think the thing with it is it'd be hard to project, which is one thing with some of this, but if you were working with a mic, I, I tend to do uh, acapella stuff mostly, but if you're working with a mic, you can really have some fun with that, so yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I gnaw on the thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. there are surely a ton of sounds that I've not come up with. I mean, the, the possibilities would be there. And another thing, when you, you know, I, I'm trying to learn hand bone to combine with it. It's really hard. But, but it would be cool. There's also, there's this, uh, I'm, I'm in Virginia now, so I'm like, okay, what's in the region? So there's this Appalachian uh, uh, tradition called Efing, which I've only seen like on Hee Haw. But it, it's uh, it goes. If you do it slow, it goes. Uh, it, it's a vowel base. You go e uh, e pa, o pa, e pa, o. But it's a e pa, o pa, e pa, o pa, e pa, o pa, e pa, a pa, e pa, o pa, e pa, o pa, e pa, o pa, e pa, a. But there are there are people way better at it than me who live on mountaintops. But but yeah, there, there's an endless kind of range of stuff and real, you know. You know, all kinds of different practices that you can kind of feed into this, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, auction. What's that? Auctioneering. Yeah, auction, auctioneering stuff. I haven't really played with that yet, but that's a really good place to look. The last year or so, as I started to run out of sounds, I started really consciously looking at, at, at a lot of stuff like beatbox and uh, e-thing and, and stuff like that. I think auctioneering would be another really good place. And, 
all kinds, mean, you know, all kinds of throat singing and, and you know, the endless endless possibilities of things you can do. Um, yeah, I think there's always room for growth, especially as you start looking outside of European traditions and maybe outside of any kind of traditions. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions? All right. How did you? Oh, yeah. How did you? Uh, you may sort of address this mm -hmm. already, but uh, how did you yourself discover sound poetry? Uh, I, uh, I can't, it's a little bit of a long story, I guess, but I, I got into, uh, my, I did my undergrad in painting, um, stopped painting as soon as I got my degree, but um, kind of, I started getting into Dada, which is another story, and, you know, I, I had been taught Dada as a, a visual art movement, which is crazy, because it was primarily a literary movement, um, but uh, that art programs don't like that kind of thing. So I started getting into Dada, and I was like, whoa, they had poetry too? And I kind of looked at that, and then I saw written sound poems, and I was like, whoa, this is really cool. And at the time, I had no idea anybody was still doing it. I thought it had died out with Dada. Um, I was like, I want to write some of these things. And so I wrote some, and then I was like, hey, anybody want to perform some sound poems? Crickets, because I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And then I, I just was like, all right, let's force myself to do it and just kind of force myself to, to start performing them because I wanted to write them, actually. Um, and then kind of went off from there. It wasn't until a few years ago I started doing noise, what I'm calling noise poetry. Like impro I didn't improvise at all until really about maybe three years ago or so. And so that's really when a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today kind of came into place relatively recent, um, which was a combination partly of um, of looking at some of the ultra electrists like uh, um, Dufresne's work, and just like, whoa, that is some crazy shit. Um, and then partly through seeing a lot of noise. And, and the, when I was starting out, the only I got kicked out of most of the um, poetry venues in Columbus, Ohio. Um, there was one slam poetry venue that would allow me to perform. Other than that, I was performing with harsh noise acts for the first couple of years that I was doing it. Nobody else was interested. So. Um, Actually kicked out, or just uh... well, it uh, I was invited not to come back. Uh, there was I, I was shouted off the stage once, okay. um, <laughs> but usually yeah, it was like you're you know like just making fun of poetry, you know, kind of thing. Um, and but I, I think you know, kind of doing it in those kind of noise contexts. Eventually, once I, uh, you know, I think um, once I, I it, it was kind of through seeing a lot of noise acts and, and pre improv stuff that then started to get me interested in improvising with it, and then that got me interested in coming up with a, a much bigger palette of noises. Because prior to that, my noises were um, mostly, I mean, they're at least clean, let's say. I mean, it was a lot of more, you know, a lot more falsetto stuff than you would hear in speech, but not the grainy, dirty, grimy, you know, I didn't sound like the Tasmanian devil. Which also actually is another good place to look. Like people like uh, Frank Welker, who does, who did the Tasmanian Devil and does a lot of uh, he does Nibbler on um, Futurama. But some voice actors sometimes are really, really good at some of this stuff too. It's something to look at. That's not that's really far off from what you ask. But anyway, that's a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you uh, might. Oh, yeah, and I've got, well, it'll also be performing later, but at some point, I do have books and discs, including uh, some books on avant-garde history and one little cheap, I think, 50-cent book that's um, got, like, four or five 19th-century sound poems that I've uncovered in it, so. It's all that over the course of the night, too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, this is Olkar Lindzen. We never actually introduced you. Oh, that's this true. Great Olkar. Uh, Yo, I'm Olkar. Robert Olkar, Virginian. Uh, so, and these are beautiful zines, so check them out. And they're going to be performing uh, Olkar uh, solos and duos with Jack Rowe. Yep. Uh, and Jasper Avery. Uh, Lauren, we will not be performing tonight. Slack. Also. So, probably. So, most of you are Yeah. Thank you very much.